There, there we go. go. Hold on, and I'm getting a message. But if you do that, then I probably can't share the PowerPoint. No, I think right. she can give you permission. That's, yeah. So. I'm a baby boomer, but I'm also a baby zoomer. <laughs> That's a... <laughs> Well, I think we're at uh, 704. Um, um, yeah, Bob, we are not doing audio or video. Thank you. Oh, no, we've got, I'm going to stop a couple of your videos because we are not doing videos. And you know what? We've now got about 45 um, participants. So we're going to start getting going on this right now. So without further ado. All right. So everyone, uh, welcome. My name is Emily Kovacs and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator here at the History of Diving Museum. Thank you for joining us for our second virtual Immerse Yourself presentation. Um, a couple housekeeping things with Zoom. We are going to have everyone muted and videos are off. So basically it is going to be me um, my other staff members or our speaker, Jim, that is the on the video screen. So if everyone can just make sure their audio and videos are turned off, and if they aren't, I will turn them off. Um, what we can do is I'm going to have the chat open. So if you have any questions for Jim or about the museum, you can send it to me. And at the end of the presentation, we will answer as many questions as we can on time. And then also, um, if you could send me your name, where you're watching from and how you heard about it, that would be great. That's how we get grant money and everything by keeping track of where our viewers are coming from. And it's what we would do if we were actually at the museum doing the presentation to begin with. Um, and basically, so we've got that going and do, 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 looking at my list of things, we've got questions. And some of you do know we do have folks that served on the Spiegel that are watching. Welcome. I'm glad you guys are able to tune in and learn a little bit more about what the, the ship's status is these days and everything. So I am now going to turn it over to the museum's executive director, Lisa Mongelia, and she's going to tell you a little bit about what we've got going on right now. Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Mangili, Executive Director at the History of Diving Museum. For those of you that haven't been here, we are in, located in the Florida Keys, Isla Mirada, mile marker 83. We've been open since 2005 and actually have a featured exhibit that will be ready to open when our doors are able to be opened again. It's called In Depth. 15 years of the Diving Museum, and it's a really cool kind of synopsis of where we started and where we're at now. We have a, a preview of some items, artifacts that aren't on display yet, and you'll get to see those before they're incorporated into the core exhibit. So we encourage you on your next trip to the Florida Keys to stop by. We are a nonprofit, 501c3. We have, uh, we rely on our members and sponsors. So thank you very much for our members who are on um, the Zoom with us tonight. Normally we would have an Immerse Yourself on the third Wednesday of every month. We also have a couple events coming up now that we uh, got the green light for the keys to open again. So check out our website, divingmuseum.org. We've got an event in June and also we're participating in Women's Dive, Patty, Women's Dive Day, the middle of July. So check that out uh, next month. Our speaker is going to be Ken Niedemeyer. He's going to be talking about coral sex and restoration. So that'll be another hot topic for everybody to tune into. We'll have all your emails. We'll send you blasts. We'll send you contact information. And tonight, of course, as everybody knows, we have Jim Wyatt, who um, not only is also a member at the museum, he served on the Spiegel Grove a couple years ago when we had an exhibit here for their 15 year anniversary of the sinking. Jim was very helpful in bringing the team together to give us the information, to put artifacts on, on display. So thank you very much, Jim. And we appreciate you telling us more um, about your experience tonight. So thanks everybody on Zoom and I'll give it back to you. All right, it's to... all you, Jim. <laughs> okay. okay, guys, um, I'm going to attempt to share 
a PowerPoint program with you. I've been practicing. I think I've got it under control. The first thing, if you'll notice my background is a picture made on the Spiegel Grove. I was on the main deck port side after that three inch 50 gun mount and primary flight controllers in the background with a flag up. Maybe that gives you some perspective. So here we go. I'm going to run through this PowerPoint presentation and uh, we'll see how it goes. All right. I think the PowerPoint presentation is up. Can everybody see it? Or Lisa and um, Emily, can you see it? Yes, I can see it. All right, great. Yep. Now, I was going through this the other day, and uh, somebody said, well, why do you have a picture of the dog? Well, Snoopy was the mascot for the Spiegel Grove, and uh, the ship was called Top Dog. And on Main Street, there's a still an emblem of Snoopy on the on the deck. I think I have a picture of it showing you somewhere uh, in these in these slide in this slide presentation. So I'm gonna start going through these slides, and uh, we'll see what happens here. First thing that didn't happen is it didn't change slides. <laughs> there we go. Uh, some of the history of Spiegel Grove LSD 32. LSD is a uh, designation for a landing ship dock. So that sounds like kind of weird. What does that mean? Well, it is a ship that carried Marines and their amphibious assault vehicles. And those were landing ships or landing craft. And so this was a dock for those. It's, that's what the designation means. Her keel was laid in 1954, so she was an old gal when she was decommissioned in uh, 1989. And she was named for Spiegel Grove, which was the home and the estate in uh, Fremont, Ohio, of Rutherford B. Hayes, the 19th president of the United States. And she was removed from service in 1989. She had um, a lot of engine room problems. Uh, we found out later that she had a leak between her main engine or number one and number two engine rooms that uh, no one knew about except the Navy. Um, and that was part of the problem with her sinking when she went down prematurely is because no one knew that that leak was there. Uh, Rob Blesser from uh, Quiescence gave us quite a rundown on that a couple of years ago. And maybe I'll get into that some more here in a few minutes. Okay, I'm going to talk about life on the Spiegel Grove. And some of you guys that have, were, were serving on there, uh, I'm sure can identify a lot of this. On the first day I was assigned to the Spiegel Grove, I walked up on the brow and I was an ensign. And an ensign is not a, uh, it's not somewhere you want to be much in the Navy. The difference between an engine and an E2 is an E2 has been promoted at least once. But I was assigned there to learn how to drive ships and to earn my surface warfare, qualif surface warfare qualifications. I was already qualified as a special operations officer. Uh, I was trained as a ship salvage diving officer. I was trained in demolitions, recompression chambers, and I was an unrestricted line officer, but the ships that I would serve on as a special operations officer require that all the officers already be qualified as ship, drive, as ship drivers or as surface warfare officers. So they sent all of us to different ships to learn how to drive them, and I was assigned the Spiegel Road. Uh, and I talked a minute ago about the Spiegel Beagle being the uh, mascot, and as you can see in that middle photograph below, is a picture of Snoopy. Uh, that thing is etched into the uh, deck on Main Street, which was the main deck right near the barber shop, right near the ship store. And the insignia on the left is the uh, Navy's um, diving salvage officer warfare pin, if you will. 
And the one on the right, as you can see, is the surface warfare qualification for special operations. And you can see um, the bomb there and the, and the dive hat. So th those were the things I was going after when I got on the ship. Um, I don't, I wound up being a Lieutenant before I got off the ship, but I never could find that little, um, name tag they gave me after that. And that was one of the belt buckle. That was the belt buckle that I wore. We all had to kind of, you know, dress up in our khaki uniforms and look spiffy. I was pretty proud of this letter. I'm not going to leave it up there a long time to bore you with reading it, but essentially it was um, a letter that the ship's captain, uh, Tom McCarthy, sent to um, uh, the Navy saying that I had finally qualified as a surface warfare officer. And uh, I was pretty proud of that. And I've, hang on, I've hung on to that letter for a long time. As you can see, it's dated 30 July, 1986. The staterooms that we, uh, that the junior officers lived in, we shared a stateroom uh, two of us, bunk bed type thing, um, little sink in there where you could shave. The showers and the heads were down the passageway a good ways, uh, so we didn't have a private shower like the XO and the captain did. But I was just reading an article uh, in Tailhook magazine that on the USS Ford, which is the newest aircraft carrier, all the uh, officer staterooms now have private showers. That's pretty cool. But anyway, my stateroom was on the O2 level on the port side, just forward of that three inch 50 gun mount that's still on the ship. And uh, like I said, I had it, I shared it with the uh, dispersing officer who was a, um, also an ensign. And we were lucky enough to have a porthole in our room so we could open it up and look out. I remember waking up one night while we were underway and that porthole was right near my bed and I woke up and my face was facing that porthole and I was looking out in a dark ocean and it just really freaked me out. Uh, but you know, it was pretty cool state room. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, <clears throat> that insignia for uh, Snoopy is still visible on Main Street. Uh, it's on the main deck, and these days, many, many divers have that as a goal to go see. Excuse me. Um, however, comma, in strictly recreational terms, that dive is beyond recreational limits, according to Patty, the organization I teach through, because Patty says you have to be within less than 130 feet from the surface, from the surface and inside a wreck. And that's about 140 feet from the surface there, but people still go. And that insignia is still pretty visible. Uh, on the right, there is one of the hats that they wanted us to wear while we're on the ship. Uh, my, I was assigned their primary billet was uh, as a division officers for the gunner's mates. And there were about, depending on the, you know, when it was, there were 15 or 20 enlisted guys that were gunner's mates. And uh, our, their job was to maintain those three inch 50 gun mounts because the captain wanted to shoot those guns when we went to sea. Um, and we, you know, wanted to have them ready. All the magazines on the ship. There were magazines all over that ship. Magazines mean places where we stored ammo. We stored all the Marines ammo. We stored all the three inch 50 ammo. And there were, I don't know how many magazines there were, 20, at least maybe 25. There was a small arms locker where we kept different things, 45 caliber pistols, uh, M79 grenade launchers, shotguns, all kinds of stuff that uh, I'll get into in a minute while we use those. Uh, that was a pretty cool part of the job is being able to deal with the guns. Later on, we got 
50 cal machine guns. I think I talk about that in a later section. And those were pretty cool. But that was my job. And of course, there were a lot of other jobs that I wound up having, but this was my primary job. Um, officer of the deck underway. This is the guy, the junior officer, uh, sometimes even a senior officer, who was on the bridge of the ship while the ship was underway that directed which way to go, how fast to go there, to be sure that the engines, the you know, 600 pound steam engines were working properly and that everything was in good shape. Uh, the entire time I was on there, we stood three section watch. And those of you that are ex Navy know what I mean by that. That means we would go to the bridge and stand there and do our job on the bridge for four hours and then get eight, and then get eight hours off to go do our job to get some sleep and then come back on the bridge. So you do the arithmetic. Um, that's why it's a young guy's job to stand three section watch because you never got more than four or five hours sleep underway. And that wasn't good sleep. Uh, now the picture on your right, there are three guys standing there. This is on the bridge and the guy, uh, Farthest right was the um, uh, engine. He operated the engine order telegraph. And you've seen this on the movies where, you know, somebody hollers, full steam ahead. Well, that guy would take those handles and push them. And it would tell the engine room what we wanted to do. Those did not control the throttles. They just rang a bell down in the engine room and said, all right, guys, we want to come uh, full steam ahead on both engines or whatever it may be. The guy on the far left was the helmsman, and his job was to steer the ship and make sure it was going on the proper compass heading. And he had to be able to take commands from the OOD, officer of the deck, you know, come right 15 degrees, come left 15 degrees, uh, maintain your heading, lots of different commands that um, those guys had to do. And then in the middle, you can barely see this guy. He was another junior officer and he had a sound powered phone. You, some of you can tell what I'm talking about. He had a sound powered phone where he could talk to the, aft rudder room i think it was called where if we lost control of the rudder from the helm he could go all the way back talk you know we're talking 300 feet further aft is where the aft rudder room was he could tell the guys down there what to do with the rudder and he could also talk to the engine room and tell the engine room what kind of uh, speed how many turns we wanted to make so those three guys were um pretty much the guys that helped steer the ship and made sure that um, what the officer of the deck commands were, were in fact understood and carried out as directed. On the left, uh, the guy facing us was the executive officer or the XO during the time I was on there. Um, you know, back in those days, it wasn't so strict on cameras. I don't know what the rules are in the Navy now on cameras, but I suspect they're, they're probably forbidden in most places. Uh, but as you can see, all the other guys are standing around up there looking out uh, over the ocean, trying to figure out which way to go, and what to do. And if you notice, this is outside. So we did most of our conning or controlling standing outside on that um, – on that conning deck. When that, when the ship was sank, uh, when it was reefed, to make an artificial reef, that part of the ship pretty much got destroyed. Um, the picture on the left, it's all bent down, mashed up. You can't hardly get in there, but it, it kind of, it was a bummer having to stand out there at night when it was pouring rain and 30 degrees 
and looking to see which way to go. And then those guys on the right, they were inside uh, in the heat or the air conditioning, depending on what it was. So that was one of the things about the Spiegel Grove that was kind of tough is you did all your conning out on that, uh, uh, on that spot. Okay. One of the things that I got involved in was um, the ship self defense force. Um, in 1986, as you, some of you may remember, the uh, we bombed Libya because as airstrikes against them because they did a uh, Libya at one time was a terrorist supporting or a country. And they bombed a, a discotheque in Berlin in 1986. And uh, so Ronald Reagan, God rest his soul, ordered uh, the Navy to go in there and bomb the hell out of Libya in retaliation against this um, bombing in that discotheque. So right around this time, we started seeing really heightened security measures at Little Creek Naval Amphibious Base which was the home port for the Spiegel Grove. It's right near, uh, right near Norfolk, right outside. Um, and the Spiegel Grove, that was her home port, along with Mobile Diving Savage Unit 2, where I worked um, as a special operations officer off and on. There was a SEAL team there. I don't remember which one it was. I think it was SEAL Team 2, but I don't remember. Tom Fibron 10, which is commander of Amphibious Squadron 10, uh, and there were a lot of other other ships there at Little Creek. And I remember when this first started up and all the security started out, I lived off the ship. And one morning it took me about 45 minutes to get onto the base because of the heightened security. They finally worked that out and figured it out. But during this time, um, it was tough to get on the base. So there were a lot of times we'd just stay on the ship when she was in port. And she spent a lot of time in port. So, um, the Navy sent us to a, uh, me and the gunner's mates, sent us to a self-defense force school. And of course, since I was the division officer, I got to be the leader of that team. And we went to a hands-on school and we shot all these guns and all these grenade launchers, machine guns, shotguns, and everything so we could uh, defend the ship should a terrorist attack happen on the base. Uh, that was a really cool school, getting to shoot all those guns. Uh, I think that school lasted, it was two weeks long. It was a pretty long school. Okay, that's what I was talking about earlier. That's that's the conning station outside the Ford Bridge, and it was destroyed during the sinking. A little 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 better picture. So our primary job was to carry these Marines out and to to fight a war. And you know, one of the Marines always said, "We love you, Navy guys. You always give us a ride when we have to go fight." Well, that's what this picture is showing. Um, the well deck, which is in the aft part of the ship, big old empty space. I've heard people call it the cargo room. Well, it's not the cargo room. It's for the Marines amphibious assault vehicles. And in this picture, you're seeing a couple of their assault vehicles. And I can't remember the designation for those. Uh, so we would go out and we would get near the beachhead they were going to assault and we would flood the well deck, lower the stern gate, and then all those Marines and all their vehicles would come out and they'd go land on the beach and go to war. Of course, we didn't do that, but we practiced it. Um, I thought I had another, yeah, this a little bit out of sequence here. So I, as the junior officer, as, as one of the junior officers and the gunnery officer, I got assigned to be the guy that was in a boat. It was about a 35-foot boat, 40-foot boat. And there was a 
young sailor that drove it and there was a little engineer an engineer that would make sure the engine ran and I, they gave me a map and they told me to drive this boat and lead those marines to the beach well we started doing all that and i got to looking around and everybody was dressed in camouflage all these marines were my crew on my boat were all dressed in their uh, work clothes, their blues, and I was the only dude with khakis on. So I was a, I was a, I was a target, and I was thinking, man, I really got screwed on this job if we were really going to war, because that's who everybody would be aiming at. But anyway, um, that's what happens when you're a junior officer. So you can see, uh, maybe I don't know if you can see it or not, but you can see how the ship was flooded down and all those landing craft came out. It's pretty cool. Now I'm gonna back up. This picture is a uh, another part of the assault capability that the Spiegel Grove had. That's an LCAC, which is a landing craft air cushion that would zoom up into the well deck and we could carry those around. Uh, and of course, you can see the uh, the flight deck where the helicopters could land. That was another cool part uh, of one of the things the ship could do. Interestingly enough, uh, when the Whidbey Island class LSD was uh, commissioned, she was built in Bremerton, Washington, and the LCACs for that ship were built in Panama City Beach, Florida. And when the when the Whidbey Island came around into the Gulf and they were going to put the new LCACs in the new LSD, the LCAC was about six inches too wide. It wouldn't fit in the well deck. Uh, I was out of the Navy by then, but that was a pretty embarrassing uh, moment for the Navy. But I digress. Uh, there are those oh, there are those things are those assault vehicles and you can see those Marines standing around. It's all dry there. And that picture was made from Pryfly, which is primary flight control. And uh, when I first started diving down uh, in Key Largo after the Spiegel Grove was sank, sunk, whatever it is, um, the dive briefings would call Pryfly crane control. So I enjoyed uh, correcting those dive masters that that's not crane control, that's pry fly. Uh, there's another one of them. You can see uh, the cranes, you can see the well deck flooded. And every now and then the captain would flood the well deck and let the crew go swimming. But mostly that well deck was for carrying uh, assault vehicles. This is the uh, 3 inch 50 gun mount that's uh, on the starboard side aft on the O2 level. And on the far right is me. And this guy, it was my gunner's mate chief. And then this guy was another officer on the ship. We were just hamming it up, making pictures on that gun mount. That gun mount's in pretty bad shape now. <laughs> but our guys, their job was to keep that thing clean and keep it working. And as I said, we would go to sea and we'd shoot that thing. We'd, we'd shoot all of them. There was three of them on there. There's still three on there now. At one point, she had four. And I don't know why they took the fourth one off. I think one of the other LSDs needed it. I don't remember. Okay, well, there, there, that's a little better picture of the helm and the engine order telegraph. And I already explained to you uh, what those guys do. That hatch, uh, I don't know if you, guys can, if you guys can see my mouse pointer or not, but that hatchway, if you go through that hatchway, the first space on the right was CIC. Uh, and um, that gives some of you a little perspective. Combat Information Center, CIC. Another picture of that uh, gun mount. These were the loaders where the uh, three inch 50 rounds were kept. 
or stored, you know, while while a surface action was going on. They were stored in um, the magazines when we weren't. And, and this down here was pyrotechnics locker. Those are pyrotechnics lockers. All those are, and as you can see, the crane, uh, ar the crane arms in the background. Those cranes, um, we we loaded all kinds of stuff on the ship with those cranes. Stores, food. Uh, when we went up to uh, Liberty Call up to Halifax, we loaded a van on there for the captain to be able to drive around in. We loaded uh, a boat on there so there was all kinds of stuff being loaded on with those cranes i think they were 50 ton cranes and of course one of the things we always tried to do was try to keep people happy and keep them in the navy and whenever we got somebody to re-enlist we would always have a re-enlistment ceremony that's me uh right there with the mouse around on the far right swearing in um, a gunner's mate, I remember the guy, gunner's mate, third class, that we uh, swore in for another four-year enlistment. Yeah, this, that's the three-inch 50 gun. I didn't take that picture. I pulled that picture off the internet. But there were, as I said, there were four of those guns on the ship at one point. And now then, that's what they look like. They're overgrown with coral. And that's a shot of Misha Hauserman on his uh, rebreather, swimming around the three inch 50 gun mount, checking it out. Well, back in the mid eighties, everybody I'm sure is aware of the fact that we were in the, in the, the Cold War if you will, Ronald Reagan was the commander in chief and he was trying to build a 600 ship Navy. When I joined the Navy, that was one of the, that was one of the draws that um, I was in there because I knew we were building the Navy and we weren't doing the, the things that some of the other presidents had done where they had slashed budgets and didn't feel like that defense spending was that important well reagan felt like it was very important so it was a good time to get in and i remember one time we were out at sea i was the um officer of the deck middle of the day and a russian trawler spy ship was crossing our bow and he was coming um in such a way that he was the giveaway vessel in other words, we, according to the rules of the road, the international rules of the road, our job was to maintain our course and speed, and his job was to avoid us. Well, there was a boomer submarine uh, right near us that we were shadowing, and that uh, trawler wanted to go over there and look at it closer, and um, he didn't give way. He just kept coming at CBDR, constant bearing, decreasing range, and we were, uh, collision was inevitable if somebody didn't do something. And the captain asked me as the officer of the deck said, uh, I think I was a JG by then, said, Lieutenant White, what are you going to do? I said, well, that's a Rusky, and uh, we're the stand-on vessel. I'm, uh, I'm going to maintain my course and speed. And he said, no, you're not. You're going to give way and let him go do what he's going to do. And I'm thinking, well, why are we going to do that? But that was his gig. Uh, he was the boss. So there was an ink sea agreement it's called prevention of incidents at sea that the Russians and the Americans signed in 1972, um, where we would do everything we could to avoid incidents at sea such as the one that uh, I'm just explaining to you. And in hindsight and in retrospect, that's why he was the captain and that's why I was just a lieutenant junior grade because he didn't want to smash into that trawler. And that trawler took the chance that we would give way and we did. 
I never really got that taste out of my mouth though. <clears throat> One of the cool things we did was work with Delta Force, which was a newly forming or formed, I don't remember which, it was already formed or it was being formed and Delta Force is still around. And <clears throat> on October 7th, 1985, uh, four men with the PLA, the Palestine Liberation, I forget what the A stands for now, um, they hijacked a uh, cruise ship called the Achille Laro. I'm sure many of you remember this, uh, off the coast of Egypt. And it was a 69-year-old Jewish American man in a wheelchair, Leon Klinghoffer. They tortured him. Well, I don't know if they tortured him, but they pushed him overboard in his wheelchair, just murdered him. And I'll, it really got everybody up in arms uh, that this happened. So in response to that incident, the Delta Force Special Operators started practicing ship assaults uh, where they could um, come in and assault the ship. So over several different nights, uh, as well we're underway, uh, we would put all non-essential crew below decks because this was a, I don't know, if it was a secret or a top secret mission that we were doing. And they would conduct night assaults on the Spiegel Grove. And uh, I had a job to sit there with a stopwatch and I was in Pri-Fly, in primary flight control. And my job was to, it's not very technical. My job was to listen for when the helicopters came in. When I first heard the helicopter, when they were assaulting the ship. And when, as soon as I heard the helicopters, I would start this stopwatch, just like you see on a track field. And then they would fly in and they would be 10 feet off the water and they were zooming fast. They would come into the ship, they would flare up and they would dump about six guys down a repelling line onto the ship and then they would zoom away. And my average time from the time I heard the helicopter come in until I saw the six men on the deck was about 15 seconds. So no one would have had any time to do anything. They were just there. And um, it, was, it was pretty cool. And I, Delta Force still operates as far as I know. I think that's a picture of a not the top helicopter that they used. I, I had a, uh, I used, I mean, I used to know what the helicopter was. For those of you that are uh, aviators, I can't remember the name of the helicopter, but uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. So, as I said, my primary billet was gunnery officer. I also worked some as a navigator. Uh, I wound up being the top secret control officer. I'll tell you why that happened in a minute. <clears throat> I was a ship self defense force team leader. And <clears throat> after the Walker spy ring was discovered, all ComSec people in the Navy were relieved of their duties immediately. ComSec meaning communication security. And some of you may remember John Walker spy ring and he worked at NOB Norfolk. He worked in, he worked for Sublance, uh, Submarine uh, Atlantic. And he got, he sold spot, he sold secrets to the Russians. I mean, top secret crypto, uh, cryptography information to the Russians. So it was for a long time that the Russians knew every move that most of our uh, attack class and our boomer class submarines were doing. So, I mean, and he enormously damaged the Navy during that time. Um, 
Well, as I said there, the Soviet Union made significant gains in naval warfare that was attributable to Walker spiring. Um, his espionage provided access to weapons and sensor data, tactics, terrorist threats, and submarine, surface submarine, airborne training, readiness and tactics, everything. So <clears throat> I go to the Spiegel Grove one morning, we're in port, and I go to quarters, and the XO comes down, says, uh, come up to my stateroom when you're done with quarters. And I said, okay. Or I probably said, yes, sir. But so I went back up to his stateroom and he told me, he said, what happened with the Walker spy ring? They caught them all. And everybody in ComSec is no longer in ComSec. And since you're the only junior officer with a top secret clearance, because I was a special ops officer, you are now going to be our top secret control officer. So pack your bag. You're going to a school to teach you how to do that. And that school was, I don't remember. It was at least five days long, maybe 10. It was a long school and there was a bunch of us in that room. There had to be 30, 40 of us in that room. And there was a warrant officer, a crusty old warrant officer that was running the class. And he said, welcome to ComSec school. If you screw this up, this is your quickest trip to Leavenworth. I'm thinking, yeah, what a way to go, what a way to motivate it. Well, anyway, so I got to be the top secret control officer, which was a real bummer of a job. Because every top secret document that came onto the ship, I had to take control of. And I had to take it in this room that locked with no windows. And I had to go through and count the pages. Some of these would have 200 pages, I don't remember, they were pretty thick, pretty thick documents. You know, like, what are we going to do if we have to attack the field? Uh, things like that. So I had to count, I had to page count those things, because if page 87 was missing, and somebody did an audit on that in three months, then I was going to Leavenworth. So that was a that was not a lot of fun, but the rest of the jobs were pretty fun. Driving the ship, navigating, and that kind of thing. But Walker's still in prison. His son is still in prison, uh, and they'll be there the rest of their life. Yeah. Okay. I already jumped forward and talked about that. <laughs> this is a little out of sequence with the top secret control officer, but sometime back in 1985, I'm early in the year, we were scheduled to go to the Mediterranean Sea and do some cruising around there. And it was discovered that the oil sump in the main feed pump, which is a big old pump that pumps water uh, into the boilers, into the uh, a lot of the parts of the ship, I can't remember everything about what that main pump. I wasn't an engineer, but somebody put sand in the sump, which destroyed it, wiped the bearings out, and it was sabotage. So the captain, of course, called NIS back. You know, nowadays it's called NCIS, but back in those days it was called the Naval Investigative Service. NCIS nowadays and i got assigned to conduct the jagman which is the judge advocate general's manual to do an investigation because there again i was the only jo a junior officer with a top secret clearance so uh my job was to try to figure out who put sand in the main feed pump well it was crickets um short of waterboarding them. I never got any uh, answers as to who did that. Didn't really expect I would because it's a job that one person could do. And the only way you ever saw that crime was to interview every person and put them on the hot seat. And that wasn't about to happen anyway. Um, that was one of the fun, another one of the fun jobs I had being I was a junior officer on the ship. Junior officers get all the, they get all the crappy jobs. But it's not all work. We had a lot of fun. Um, 
we spent a couple of months, maybe more than that, I don't remember, at least two months cruising up and down the eastern seaboard, conducting at sea ops, uh, shooting the guns, doing unrep, uh, underway replenishment, you know, where two ships would get side by side running 15, 18 knots and pass uh, groceries over and pass ammo over and refuel and that kind of stuff. Uh, we went to Halifax. Uh, and Boston and my uh, my saying is I spent a week in Boston one afternoon uh, but it was it was pretty fun doing that and of course what stays what happens on Liberty Call stays on Liberty Call um, I won't go into what all happened on Liberty Call because this is not a uh, R-rated event but it was a lot of fun we had a lot of fun in Halifax we had a lot of fun in Boston and we had a lot of fun uh, operating up there. The coolest thing was the Bay of Fundy, which has a 60 foot tidal range. I mean, the tide goes 60 feet of difference. And as we were cruising up the East Coast, the tide was uh, actually setting the ship off course slightly. It was such a massive tidal change. We were all sitting in little and uh, in port at Little Creek, Virginia, and uh, we got ordered to get underway to avoid Hurricane Gloria. Hurricane Gloria was coming up the East Coast, and it was headed toward the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. So the Navy brass decided that you know we can't go out of the Chesapeake Bay because we'll just be headed right into the uh, right into the storm. So what we did is we went further up into the Chesapeake Bay and we had to do that at night because of the timing. It just wound up being a nighttime op. And there were other capital warships that made the Spiegel Grove look small in this line of battleships and carriers and hundreds of thousands of steel hundreds of thousands of tons of steel making 15 knots in the dark and that was a pretty uh that, uh, that was a pretty uh, freak out situation they put me with a night observation device like a, a, a telescope one you know you look down it and you're looking for you're looking for whatever you might run over or other ships and of course being a junior officer being a junior ensign or the JG, I didn't know that that would mess up your, uh, what's the word I'm looking at, your, your vision, not, not your night vision, as well as your ability to judge distance, spatial vision. And I, when I got through looking through that thing after about an hour, I was going back inside the ship and I ran right into a hatch. So, you know, I had a bruise on my face for a while, just another one of those wonderful jobs that us junior officers got. On the far left there is the captain. Uh, at that point, he appears to be a full commander. I think he made captain while we're on the ship. Uh, next to him is the executive officer. Uh, next to him is one of the engineering officers and the guy saluting was the damage control assistant. And he was leaving the ship that day and I just happened to be around with a camera. And uh, you know, they get rung off the ship, they ring the bell for you as you're leaving. Uh, this is my background. I made this picture with my GoPro camera um, a couple of years ago. It's pretty cool. You can see there's a uh, Goliath grouper above the American flag. And the American flag there is the uh, pr primary flight control. And these racks that you're seeing in the foreground people always ask me what were those for what were those for well they carried our lifeboats we learned a lesson from the titanic right that we need to carry enough lifeboats for everybody and they were all over the ship and they were hung on those racks um this is the bridge and um 
it, it looks nothing like the ship did when the ship was uh, commissioned and then serviced because, as I said earlier, the uh, uh, the conning bridge up front got ripped off during the sinking when, it, when she went upside down. And I guess that's the end. That's the end of it. So now I'll turn it over back to uh, Emily and Lisa. And if anybody has questions, um, I'm glad to try to answer them. We've got some guys on here that are probably equally, if not more so, qualified to answer questions about her than I am, like Rich. So if anybody has questions, I'll do my best to try to answer them. Okay. All right, give me one second to bring myself back into the mix and I've got a couple questions. So um, one that I just had come in from Brian, how much time did you spend on the Spiegel? 18 months, give or take a week or two. All right, excellent. And I've also got from David Stoles, um, if you could talk about how it felt to see these pictures of this great ship and then go diving on it on as a wreck. So like, how could you compare kind of the two of them and what kind of feelings did you have with it? Well, at first it's, well, and it still is somewhat nostalgic, of course. I spent those 18 months on the ship and I spent a lot of time on there and made a lot of good friends. And uh, when I worked as a command duty officer on the ship in port, I had to walk every space on the ship during that 24 hour period. So I knew the ship, I'm not gonna say intimately, but pretty darn good. So nowadays when I get to go diving on her, I recognize uh, all the spaces that I'm going in, what they were for, uh, it's pretty cool going into my stateroom and, and seeing that that porthole was still there. So it's kind of nostalgic uh, to go in there. I still love going into that ship. Excellent, excellent. Um, I've also got one from um, Mike Schwartz. How many times have you dove on the Spiegel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would guess a couple of hundred. <laughs> I believe that. I, I, quit um, logging, I quit logging my dives uh, once I reached 10,000 dives, which was about 10 years ago. I've been diving since I was 12 years old, so I would guess a couple hundred dives. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, I do also have one from Jenny. She did let me know that the name of the helicopter was a UH-60, so she did have that. And she did have a question, is there any video or do you plan on doing a video of a dive as you narrate the what and where of what we are seeing now? So I guess maybe like comparing the two side by side. I have some underwater video on a YouTube channel. I wound up with two YouTube channels. I'm not really sure how back over the years. I think one is my cave diving YouTube, and I think it's Jim Wyatt. And then I have another YouTube channel, it's called Captain Jim Wyatt. And I have some videos of uh, me swimming through the ship. I've got one that's 10 or 15 minutes long, swimming into the engine rooms and showing the boilers and the uh, control panels and all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it's pretty cool to see those videos, uh, but I don't do any narrating as to like how you compare me swimming through it versus me living on it and working on it though. Gotcha. Okay. Um, oh, this is, this is one from Bob. What is your favorite memory and least favorite memory of the Spiegel Grove? <laughs> Well, this may sound terrible, but my least favorite memory is the day I was assigned to her. And my favorite memory is the day I got off. Well, there are a lot of things that happened in between that are very uh, cool memories. 
And those are some of the ones I put on the PowerPoint, like doing the Delta Force stuff, um, doing Liberty Calls up and down the East Coast, uh, fiddling with those guns and the Ship Self Defense Force, and just working with the uh, gunner's mates. They're very special people. Excellent. Um, from Dive Buddy, what is the most interesting creature you've seen while diving on the Spiegel? Uh, divers that have no control of their buoyancy. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, the most interesting creature, I would have to say those great big old Goliath groupers. I mean, some of these things get up to 600 pounds and they're the size of a Volkswagen. Um, and there's a lot of small things on there like there would be on any artificial or normal reef. But I, I think the Goliath groupers is the coolest thing. Excellent. Um, and also from Bob, and this kind of ties into a question I had earlier on um, about how did the Spiegel come to its resting place in Key Largo and how do you feel about them using her as an artificial reef? Well, that story, I can only tell you secondhand uh, how that ship came to be there because I was not involved in her sinking. However, uh, uh, there were some guys in Key Largo that decided they wanted an artificial reef, so they went up and got the Spiegel Grove. Um, I'm trying to think of their name. Rob Blesser's one of them. The guy that owned Doc, Doc from Ocean Divers is one. Stephen Frank. Uh, there are several others that got together and decided we need to sink a ship out here. And they raised money. Uh, they got the ship. They cleaned the ship up. They brought it down. And unbeknownst to them, there was a leak in between the number one and number two engine room bulkheads. And apparently it was a fairly substantial leak. And that's what caused her to sink prematurely. And the reason they know that is because some years later or months later, somebody had gotten a desk off the Spiegel Grove and they were going through the papers in that desk and they found a letter from Nav C that said, hey, this ship isn't, doesn't have its watertight integrity. It can't stop progressive flooding. So we're gonna take her out of service. And when those guys bought that ship, nobody from the Navy remembered that. And um, so that's how it came to sink prematurely. Now, how do I feel about it? I think it's cool. Uh, I mean, what's the odds of, uh, of, of the ship? One of the ships, I was on several ships in the Navy. What are the odds of them sinking that ship in what was my backyard? I was living in Kudjo Key uh, ramrod key and i had a dive shop down there at the time and what are the odds of that happening and then uh, of course she was on her port side for a while that kind of sucked but uh, when she was righted that was very cool and she's still very cool now so yeah i love it i have more fun on her as she, after she sank than i did while i was ship's company <laughs> understandably so <laughs> Um, does anyone else have any questions or do any of my um, folks who also served on the Spiegel have any comments or thoughts? Um, if you message me, I can unmute you and that kind of such stuff. I'll give you guys a second. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure some of these guys, they saw a lot more action with the Spiegel. By the time I was on her, she was a pretty crippled old lady and barely moved around. But some of these guys uh, on here, like Rich and those guys that were on her in the 60s, they saw her in her, her heyday. And I'd sure love to hear some stories from those guys. Can I, can I talk? Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> Go um, right ahead. Yes, well, this is Rich. And I, yeah, I was on there in the, uh, in 70, 71. And I noticed one of my buddies, uh, John, Smithson also uh, is on here today too. We served together, but I, I have to tell you, Jim, the one story you told went back to me. I was junior officer. I was officer of the deck one time in the, in the med, and we had a situation similar to yours with a, a Russian ship crossing our bow. We had the right of way, and um, they had been following us 
almost for four or five days, I remember, and they were doing it all the time, and they would they would make you leave your right of way to let them go by. And I remember the captain was sitting in the chair, and I said to him, sir, what do you want me to do? And he said, I'm tired of this BS. You stay your course and speed. And, wow. and, and we did. And he pulled out of the he he went out of the way, and uh, I tell you what, my knees still shake when I think about that. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I'm still mad when I think about mine. <laughs> but I I must tell you, I've enjoyed very much your your time on it. You were there a little bit after I was, but it sounded very similar. So thanks very much. Thank you for your service too, Rich. Do I have any other Spiegel Grove uh, alumni? Maybe. <laughs> well, Emily. Sorry. Oh, Brenda said that Bill served in 64 and loved every minute of it. Thank you for Thank sharing, you. Brenda. Brenda Dorsey. Lisa, do you have any, um, you know, final comments or remarks before we kind of wrap things up? Um, I do, and, and that gives people an, another minute to add comments if they uh, served on Spiegel, and we can get that in there too. But um, two different things. One is the benefit of having this presentation tonight and um, having Jim's expertise. Jim works for Rainbow Reef as a boat captain and they're one of the Blue Star operators in the Florida Keys. This is also considered a continuing education. So I know that we have some other people that have signed on to watch it so that they get the continuing education credit. We're also going to be having it recorded so that they can, um, you know, use up that and you know it, there's nothing better Jim like you said to let the dive masters know the truth behind the the locations and what things are called because that makes that briefing so much more authentic before they take divers down to uh, swim the passages that uh, that you served on and um, as the history of diving museum we thank you for your time as service we thank you for being a member we thank you for helping us with the uh, Spiegel Grove exhibit when we had it a couple years ago and um, as a as a thank you as a, for a presenter, we're extending your membership one year. So once COVID is over, you can come to the museum 360 right on. days a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I enjoy doing these things. I'm kind of a ham anyway. Everybody knows me knows I'm a ham. So I had fun. So thank you. And Emily, I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, I did have uh, one other thing from Kurt Tid. He said, thank you very much for sharing. He was on a destroyer sailing around the SPG in 1980 on a NATO cruise all around the North Sea. Lots of Russians on that cruise, too. <laughs> yeah, they were everywhere. No, so that is, but I think other than that, we're pretty good. I've had a lot of thank yous for doing the presentation, Jim. This was really fantastic. And um, for everyone else, um, in the next day or so, I will get this processed and then I will have it available on our YouTube and I will share the link um, through emails as well as on our social media so you can share it with other folks. Um, and I know especially a lot of the Rainbow Reef crew is looking to um, have this to watch as well. But I think we've got everything is pretty good. Oh, and so this is a side note. Um, for more museum stuff once we do open. Um, we are one of the museums that partakes in the Blue Star Museum program, which typically runs from Armed, Service, Armed Forces Day through Labor Day. And it's a program that the National Art Endowment puts together that allows active duty military and up to five of their immediate family members into select museums and attractions for free. Um, Obviously right now with us not being open, um, that's slightly delayed. And we also found out that the program itself is not actually happening this year. But because of our wonderful sponsor, Liz Bonas, she is actually going to continue um, allowing this to happen during the normal time through the summer. So when we do open up, if you have any friends or family that are in active duty, 
they are more than welcome to come to our museum and up to five of their immediate family members are able to come as well. So something to keep in the back of your mind and thank you very much Liz for that. That's a wonderful contribution for our military members and Coast Guard as well. Um, but other than that, I think we're, we're, we're ready to sign off and say so long until next time. <laughs> thank you, Emily. Thank you, Jim. Thank you everybody for coming in.